Today is the day we're delving into polygyny. I think it's going to uh, perhaps be a bit controversial, but not to y'all. I don't think it'll be that controversial to us. I kind of thought about every adult grouping here, and I'm like, I don't think it's going to be too controversial to us, but I'm thinking the YouTube land on both sides of the issue, people will have something to say. That, that's what I think. So I said polygyny. I remember when I first heard the term polygyny, it was from Pastor Dow. And I wrote him an email. I said, <coughs> uh, Pastor, it's polygamy. And he very politely corrected me and said, uh, no, it's not. And so I looked it up. And polygyny is one man, multiple wives. What's polygamy? Multiple marriage. Multiple marital partners. So it could be a woman with multiple husbands or a man with multiple wives. And then the other one at the other end is polyandry. That's one woman with multiple husbands, right? So we're going to talk about polygyny today. We're going to talk a little bit. We, I'm going to talk, maybe we will too when we're done. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about divorce. Not as much about divorce as I could go into because it's going to be long already. But it, it figures into where we're going today. Um, little warning, I'm not going over anything graphic, but we are covering adult themes, if you will. Um, and you know, I realize the audience, but there's adult themes going on there. And then I guess for them, because again, I don't think this part, I'm telling the Shofarians anything, but for YouTube, before we get started, I am married to Sister Kate and only to Sister Kate, and I have no intention or desire to have another wife, now or later. Um, so that's like truth in advertising. I also have no mistresses or concubines, and we're going to touch on that very, very briefly today. Um, so truth in advertising, that's where I'm at. So I get the question a lot on YouTube or in email. Pastor Fox, do you support polygamy or do you support polygyny? What does that mean? Do I send them money? I mean, you know, do I support them? After today, I think people will know exactly where I stand. All right. You can start flipping to Exodus chapter 21 while I'm talking. The first thing, oh, and you can take notes too. The first thing that we're going to cover, the first point in this, this teaching today is going to have about four or five big chunks. The first thing we have to understand is polygyny is not forbidden by Torah. And we know that we trust and follow Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, and we try to keep Torah. Polygyny is not forbidden by Torah. Pastor Dow, again, did a debate that I watched live. They streamed it live with another pastor, and it was about polygyny. And this other pastor said, no, you can't do that. And he said, all right, let's do a debate. And Pastor Dow, pastor Dow won the debate by debate rules. You know, if you ever had kids, would you not do that? He won the debate by saying, show me in Torah where it says a man can't have multiple wives. Because if it's forbidden, it'll be forbidden in Torah. That's our guidelines. And the debate went on for an hour and a half, and, and of course the guy couldn't do that. But not only is polygyny not forbidden in the Bible, it's provided for. There are rules for polygyny. We're going to look at a little bit of that. Exodus 21, I think we're going to verse 10. Yes, we are. If he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, her duty of marriage shall not diminish. So if a man has a wife and he takes another wife, he cannot diminish his first wife. He can't treat her less than on a whole range of issues because he's got a new wife. 
So that doesn't say if he takes another wife, he's got to get rid of the first wife, or he can't take another wife. There's rules for doing that. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 21. Man, it's windy here. I need a rock. Deuteronomy 21. Verse 15. Deuteronomy, the second telling, 21, verse 15. If a man has two wives, take him out and stone him. That's not what it says, right? It says, if a man has two wives, so what's fixing to follow is a, a rule, a commandment, for if a man has two wives. One's beloved, and the other's hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated, and if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, then it shall be when he makes his sons to inherit that which he has, that he shall not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has for he is the beginning of his strength, and the right of the firstborn is his. And so if a man has two wives, and he doesn't, he hates, not doesn't like, he hates the wife who has his firstborn son, he still has to give his firstborn son the firstborn son stuff. Double portion. So again, there's a guy with two wives. What do we call ourselves? Israelites. Israelites. Where did Israelites... From whence did Israelites come? From whom did Israelites come? What's the name come from? Israel. From Israel. What was his name before Israel? Jacob. Jacob. How many wives did Jacob have? Three. Jacob had two wives and two concubines. That's all we're saying about concubines today. But he definitely had... Two wives. We come from Jacob. So Israel, the group, the tribal, the nation, started with multiple wives. Yah clearly doesn't forbid it. David, King David, a man after Yah's own heart. How many wives did David have? Oh, he had a bunch. We're not going there today, but you can go to 2 Samuel chapter 3. And it just goes on and on and on. David had a bunch of wives. And he was a man after Yah's own heart. The wisest man that ever lived. What was that? What's his name? Solomon. Solomon. How many wives did Solomon have? Bunches and concubines. Now, Truth in advertising, they led to his downfall, but he was the wisest man who ever lived. And he had all these wives and, and concubines and stuff. So again, not only is polygyny not forbidden in Torah, it's provided for, it's, there are rules set out for it, there are examples of it given, some examples of great men, patriarchs, it's allowed in Torah. Polygyny is permissible in Torah. Why? Why is polygyny allowable? Two words. We're going to talk about the Leverite Law, and that's part of it. Life and death. That's why polygyny is allowed. Israel... Well, before I get to that, what's the first commandment? It's a trick question. Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply, right? Genesis 2, 8, I think. Be fruitful and multiply. That is the first commandment that Yah gives to people, right? He gives that to Adam and, and Chava, Eve, and he says, be fruitful and multiply. It's the first thing he tells humans. So it's kind of a trick question because, you know, the first commandment we say is, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. You shall have no other gods before me. All right. 
The first commandment is be fruitful and multiply. Israel was a nation at war. Especially when, by the time Moses goes up to Sinai and he's getting the law and then he's giving it to the Israelites. Janelle, please fix your legs. Don't make me tell you that again. Thank you. All right, so Israel is a nation at war. People are dying. Men are dying, and they're leaving widows behind. The state of women in that time period was not the same as the state of women today. A woman without a man was in danger. She was prey. She was going to be made a slave or bad things were going to happen to her. And so for that reason, brothers, whether that was real brothers, which we're fixing to get to, or just brothers in arms, would take another brother's wife as his wife to protect her. But then she's his wife. It's not like she becomes the maid and just cleans up the living room or something. Israel is Yah's chosen people. He wants them to grow. There therefore needs to be offspring. And Brother Fletch brought up the Leverite law. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 25. Verse 5. If brethren dwell together, and one of them die and have no child, then the wife of the dead shall not marry without, without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she bears shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. I just noticed something about that that I've never noticed before as I was just reading it. I remember I, we've talked about this from here before because I said I was uh, very thankful when my brother had a son because I knew this rule then. I was not keeping toward them, but I knew this rule then. And it's like, all right, cool, my brother has a son, I'm good. Um, but it says when they dwell together, that's kind of interesting. So what if your brothers don't dwell together? Maybe it doesn't apply. There's wiggle room there. But the bottom line is, hey, we need the line to continue. We need to generate progeny. And so that's life. Life and death are the two reasons that we, uh, we read about this in Torah. But that was a long time ago. That's when Israel was fighting and people were dying and we needed to increase the size of Israel. What about more modern times? What about... New Testament times, because we hear that argument a lot, right? i got to close this. There we go. In what most people call the early Christian era, the time of Yeshua and immediately thereafter, the time when the people who followed Yeshua were following what they called the way, right? The way of Yeshua, but most people say that's when they were the first Christians. The Israelites referred to by most people as the Jews at that time, practiced polygyny. Did y'all know that? I didn't know that until I started researching this. The Jews of that time, you know, first century forward, they were practicing polygyny. And in fact, Josephus writes about it, about Jews practicing polygyny. Justin Martyr writes about it. Jews, he calls them Jews, but it was Israelites practicing um, polygyny. And in 393 AD, common era, Theodosius was like the Roman emperor. He made a law. There'd been laws before that saying, hey, this polygyny stuff, uh-uh, ain't going to happen. But they kind of made an exception for the Jews because eh, they're different people. He said, hey, Jews, cut it out. No more, no more uh, free pass for you guys doing polygyny. That was in 393. They were still practicing polygyny. And that's kind of an interesting thing if you think about it, because Theodosius is a Roman, which is a Greek, right? 
So we talk about the Greek way of thinking, the Greek mindset, and we talk about the Hebrew, the Israelite mindset. The Greeks are bearing down on and saying, hey, no more of this polygyny. We're not going to put up with it anymore. That was in 393. And this is all history. This isn't conspiracy or anything like that. First Timothy, New Testament, chapter 3, ver or chapter 3, verse 12. A bishop shall be blameless and the husband of one wife. How many people have heard that before? I've heard that before. What's a bishop? If we had to pick a bishop today, what's a bishop? See, I don't think it is a pastor. Don't forget, YouTube. I'm not looking for another wife. But I don't think it is a pastor. I think a bishop is like the head of a church, like a big church, like almost like a Catholic bishop today. If, and that goes into another five-fold ministry and all that stuff. But anyway, it says a, a bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Well, if this was written by Paul to Timothy, giving him instructions for how the church is going to develop, a bishop can only have one wife. Okay, got it. Where's that leave the non-bishops? Right? If you're saying this guy can only have one wife, then obviously there are people that have more than one wife. So even if you say pastors are bishops, okay, cool, I can only have one wife, but that doesn't say anything about the congregation. As far as Paul talking to Timothy is concerned, but there's more on that. A bishop can be the husband of only one wife is how it's written in, in English. The Greek rendering of that is weird. People who study Greek say this is a weird way to put Greek words together. And those Greek words are, because I looked them up, mias gunaikos andra, the husband of one wife. Mias gunaikos andra. It can be rendered three different ways, and that's where all the argument comes. But understand, when Greek scholars look at it, they're like, this is written weirdly. It's not like we could take a regular sentence and make it read probably two or three ways. They all say, this is written weird. So, the first way, it means a one-wife man. Well, a one-wife man means he's monogamous, right? I'm a one-woman man, baby. It's so monogamous. So a bishop will be monogamous. Again, that begs the question, what if you're not a bishop? Another way to read that is a wife man, which means he's married. He has a wife. Could have two or three or four or five or six wives. Personally, I believe, and I've talked about this before, uh, especially at Round Prairie, that's what it means. A bishop has to be married. How are you going to be able to counsel married couples if you don't know what it means to be married? If you haven't experienced all the joys and other stuff that comes with being married, <laughs> right? I mean, you got to understand that from a personal perspective. And I think that's what it means, a wife man. But then the other, th the other way it can be translated is first wife man which means he cannot be divorced. He still has to be married to his first wife. We're going to talk about divorce a little bit more later. In either case, either case, in any case, that's bishops. And it only talks about bishops being married to one wife. Goes through the other qualifications there in 3 Timothy, and it doesn't have that. Yeshua quotes, and we can read it a couple times, he quotes Genesis 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 24, when he says, the two shall become one flesh. And people say, see? They're one flesh if they're married, so how can he have two wives? That, that would be weird. There's a couple explanations for that, and there's a couple ways I could go on that, but I think the easiest way to go is to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm in 2 Corinthians. Here's where we get a little bit adult. Throughout history, married men 
have visited prostitutes, right? Fact of life, right? Not saying it's right, not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying they do it. Are they still married when they do that to their wife? Yeah. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 6, um, 16. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. Do you see where that's going? I don't really want to get too much more graphic than that. But the two are one when a man's with a prostitute. So it doesn't negate the fact that he's married to a wife. What Yeshua was talking about was a spiritual connection. What about, so that's Old Testament, that's New Testament, kind of coming up through the, uh, the time of the apostles and Yeshua. What about today? Man, this Bible has seen better days. Polygyny, one man, multiple wives, is lawful, according to Torah. Not according to the federal government of the United States, but according to Torah, it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, said Paul, but all things are not expedient, which means profitable. All things are lawful unto me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And then it's interesting to note, if you look down below what he just said, the examples he uses are overeating and fornication, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. All things are lawful unto me, uh, but it's not always a good idea. And so I think on the first part of the sermon, I made the people who are pro-polygyny go, yeah! And the people who are anti-polygyny go, bah, 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 bah. and now we're going to start flipping it around a little bit. We're today. All things are lawful unto me, but not all things are expedient. True story. I know seven brothers, Israelites, who have taken second wives. I know them personally. In modern times, obviously, if I know them. Do you know and those are the, I only know seven that I know of. There could be more that I don't know of, but I know of seven people who, personally, who took second wives. All things are lawful unto me, but it's not always a good idea. Do you know all seven of those second wives are no longer their wife? The seven people I know who took second wives, all of them, their second wife, Boom. Gone. Well, what's going on there? I mean, think about that for a second. It seems to me, and here's the other thing. For most of those, their second wife, if you'll just allow me the, the plain speaking, didn't last but a couple months at most, and she's gone. So it seems to me, and again, I'm just going to speak plainly without sugarcoating it, these brothers weren't too bright when they took this second woman to be a second wife, if it only lasted a couple months. I mean, where was their spiritual discernment if this marriage only lasted a couple months? Think about that for a second. It's like, oh, this ain't working out. Here's your bill of divorcement. Get out of here. I think you're lacking spiritual dis discretion, discernment. And honestly, of the people I know who've done that, I question their motives. I said there's two reasons to get a second wife or a third wife or a fourth wife or a fifth wife. 
What are those two reasons? Life and death. Life and death. We're going to perpetuate the species, the Israelites, or we're taking care of somebody because somebody died. So, you know, we're taking care of a sister. Um, let's look a little bit, because all of these guys, all of these seven brothers divorced their second wife. Now, they didn't marry him in the state of Missouri or Oklahoma or Arkansas or Mississippi or whatever, but they did, you know, biblical marriages. And, you know, I don't think you need a state license to say you're married. And when they divorce them, you have to give a woman a writ of divorce. And that's what we're going to look at a little bit. Please turn to Matthew 19. Matthew 19, verse 1. And it came to pass that when Yeshua, Jesus, had finished his sayings, he departed from Galilee, and he came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. Now the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him. They're testing him, they're trying to trip him up. And saying to him, Is it lawful? Is it okay with Torah, O teacher, for a man to put away his wife for every cause. Hmm. All right, I'll come back to that. For every cause. And he answered and he said unto them, Have you not read? This is like a slam. Whenever Yeshua says, Have you not read? It's a slam. And he's using it on Pharisees because they're supposed to be the well-read ones who get this stuff. And he's saying, have you not read? That he which made them at the beginning, made them male and female, and said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. That's Genesis chapter 2. Wherefore they are no more twain, but they are one flesh. What therefore God, Elohim, has joined together, let no man put asunder. And they said unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? So you sh see, they're trying to find something they can argue with Yeshua on. Now, there were two schools of, if you will, there's always two ways to look at something. There, you know, there's probably a thousand ways. But there were definitely two ways, two schools of rabbinical thought on marriage and divorce at the time of Yeshua. One was called the school of Hillel. So he was like some famous rabbi guy. And basically he said, you can divorce your old lady. You can give her a writ of divorcement if she burns your breakfast. <laughs> Gone. Divorce. They were loose on a lot of things. They were very worldly. And that's what had kind of come forward into the Pharisees that Yeshua was railing against. And then there was another school, and honestly the name escapes me of that school, <coughs> where they said no. Um, they're saying about what Yeshua is getting ready to say here. Um, the only reason you can divorce somebody. But, so what about this thing with Moshe? Moshe said, hey, here's how you do a writ of divorcement. Let's look at that. Deuteronomy chapter 24. Keep your finger here. We're coming back. Deuteronomy chapter 24. What are you guys talking about? Verse 1. When I find it. When a man has taken a wife and married her, and it comes to pass that she finds no favor in his eyes. Because he has found some uncleanness in her. This is where all the argument happened between the schools of thought. What is this uncleanness in her that she is no longer favored by her husband? And the Hillelites, if you'll allow me that term, were like, man, she burned my food. All right. The other people were like, no, it's something more deeper. But it says, if he has found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give it in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she is departed from his house, she may go and be another man's wife. So she's free at that point. And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement, does that happen in today's society? Are there women who've been divorced more than once? 
and giveth it in her hand, and sendeth her out of his house. Or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that, she is defiled, for that is an abomination before Yahweh, and she shall not cause the land to sin, which Yahweh thy Elohim gives thee for an inheritance. And so here's the deal. Moshe says, all right, if you find some uncleanness in her, you can give her a bill of divorcement, and then she's free to go marry. But if she does, you can never take her back. Because she's been with somebody else. All right, we're just going to leave it at that. But there is a writ of divorcement there. And again, the argument in Israel was over what is this uncleanness? You found some uncleanness in, in her, you're not happy. Let's go back to Matthew. Let's see how Yeshua looks at this. So he said, they ask him, why did Moses then give a command? Why did he, if we're not supposed to do that, if they're one flesh, why did Moses give them a way to divorce? Eight, and he said unto them, Moshe, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I, so, it's like, hey, it's because y'all are a bunch of boneheads. That's why. And Moshe was just giving you a way to have a divorce. Now, here's the deal. Israel, at this time, had just come out of where? When Moses wrote this and, and said, Egypt. They were surrounded by Egyptian gods and did, was just Israel come out with Israel? It's a mixed multitude. There were people who were still worshiping other gods. I mean, heck, they made a golden calf when Moses was up going to get the, the law, right? So they were worshiping other gods and it was like, hey, that was the uncleanness. And most of the time when we read the word fornication in the Bible, it's talking about something dealing with another God or another mighty being or whatever. And so these women, this uncleanness in them was they're not giving up their old gods. And so they're still worshiping their own gods. And it's like, this ain't working. If you're going to be like that, you need to get out of here. Let's see what he says. Because of the hardness of your heart. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife. Now this is Jesus. This is Yeshua talking about divorce. Remember when I said the seven brothers I know who had seven wives? Seven brothers had seven wives. That's true. <laughs> Isn't that a movie or a poem or something? Um, they all gave them writs of divorce. I don't know why they gave them writs of divorce. But I'm thinking it wasn't necessarily in line with what Yeshua is about to say here. Whoever shall put away his wife except for fornication and shall marry another commits adultery and whosoever marries her which is put away does commit adultery. The disciple said to him, if the case of a man be so with his wife, <laughs> it's not good to marry. You mean I marry this woman and I got to stay married to her? You might as well not marry. I mean, that's what they're basically saying. You mean I'm stuck with her? Come on. I like Hillel. He says when I get tired of her, I trade. she's 40, I trade her in for 220s. That's a paraphrase. But he said unto them, hey, all men cannot receive this saying. Hey, it's not for everybody. Save they for whom it is given. And then he goes on talking about eunuchs. And then he says, hey, he that is able to receive it, let him receive it. Flip back in Matthew to chapter 5, verse 31. Matthew 5, verse 31. You okay? I know this is shocking, Sister Donna, but... <laughs> this is Yeshua speaking. Remember the words in red? If there's anything important in the New Testament, it's the words in red. Yeshua says, it has been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. <coughs> yep, that's in Deuteronomy 24. We just read it. But Yeshua's clarifying it. Yeshua not only didn't do away with Torah, I submit to you he made it harder, at least for the people who weren't going to the spirit of the law. That's like when he said, if you look at another woman, you say you, you don't commit adultery, but I'm telling you, if you look at another woman with lust in your eyes, you've committed adultery. That's harder. That's a harder standard for adultery. Check out what he says. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, except for the cause of fornication, 
causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced commits adultery. Except for fornication, and I submit to you that doesn't necessarily mean only what it means in modern English, and I don't want to go further than that. It also means worshiping other gods. Except for that case, if you put her away and she remarries, she's committing adultery and whoever marries her commits adultery because in the eyes of Yah, she's still that man's wife. And so somebody is sleeping with somebody else's wife. And that's what adultery is, a man sleeping with another man's wife. He says you can't do it. So back to the seven brothers who kicked the wives to the curb. Unless it was fornication, meaning they're going after other gods, well, why would you marry a woman and not know what god she's worshiping anyway? Do you see my point? It's just, it's ridiculous that this happens. And like I said, I question the motivation of those people. We, Israelites, are not, and I'm talking to men mostly at this point, are not supposed to divorce our wives except for fornication. And there's like the two different things of it. But, you know, if your wife starts worshiping Buddha or something, you might be okay to kick her to the curb. However, comma, do you remember the part about being unequally yoked? If you're unequally yoked, and that does mean if, if the spouse, either the male or the female spouse, is not worshiping Yah, and that person doesn't want to leave the relationship, we read, let them stay, because they might come around through your good example. But it also says, but if, they, if, they're, if they're, you're unequally yoked, if they're not worshiping Yah, and they do want to go, let them go. Cool. That's the same thing. That's in keeping with what Yeshua said about fornication. But again, I submit to you, why would you marry somebody and then figure out two or three months later, oh, whatever. And see, I don't think that was the excuse for these bills of divorcement. Here's what I think happened, and I know this in a couple cases from talking to people. These brothers are married. To their first wife, their first love, and for whatever reason they decide to marry another wife. And man, she just becomes that bad word. She's not nice. She's unruly. She's haughty. She's not submissive to me. She starts walking around here like she's the queen bee, and it just ain't working. Here's your bill of divorcement, right? And that's what's happening. Is that right? Should a man give this uppity woman who doesn't understand that I'm the man and you're the woman and I'm in charge of this household and I don't like your attitude and you're not changing so you need to hit the road, should he do that? Should he give her a bill of divorcement? Well, it ain't fornication. Not only that, let's look at Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 9. I like this verse. It is better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than with a brawling woman in a big old house. Hey, this is talking to men, clearly. Dude, it is better to just go live up on the roof than inside that big old nice house you have with this contentious, quarrelsome woman. It doesn't say she's a contentious, quarrelsome woman, give her a writ of divorce and kick her to the curb and go look for some other fine young thing. It says go live on the roof. This is my house. I'm not living on the roof of my house. It's better that than living in there with her, man, and putting up with that. There's another proverb that's just like the drip, drip, drip of rain. This woman just... I'm not going there. Um, go to Proverbs 25, verse 24. This is Old Testament. It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling, contentious woman and in a wide house. Same phrase. It doesn't say 
My wife no longer pleases me because she just doesn't get it. She's constantly arguing with me. She's constantly running her yap. She's a brawling woman. Kick her to the curb, give her a writ of divorce. It says, you know, I, I feel, this, what this says is, I feel your pain, brother. It's better you just go, li-. and you know, the rooftop was like, a, like a, a version of a balcony, really. Dude, it's just better if you just go to your man space and hang out. I get it. It's tough to be you, right? But it doesn't say give him a writ of divorce. What about? We're talking today now. I'm just using old examples. What if you just hate that woman? Man, I married her and four months later I hate her. I can't stand her. Well, we were there, but let's go back. Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy chapter 21. Verse 15. I hate the woman. If a man has two wives, one beloved and the other hated, kick the hated one to the curb. It doesn't say that. It says not only... <laughs> you you got to treat her son as your firstborn son. It doesn't matter if you've decided you don't like her anymore. So, polygyny is allowed by Torah. I do not think polygyny is a good idea today for Israel. Notice I did not say you can't do it. I said I don't think it's a good idea and I've got several reasons why. Most of us men, most of you men on YouTube who are married took what I call traditional wedding vows. I promise to have and to hold in sickness and health for richer, for poorer, forsaking all others till death do we part. So help me God or whatever. I mean, you're making this vow. You're giving your word in front of your God, your friends, your church, and you're saying, I'm going to forsake all others. I certainly said that. And I wasn't even a Christian when I got married, but we, we said traditional vows. That's my promise. A man's word is his bond. Let your yeas be yea and your nays be nay. And I said, hey, I'm going to forsake all others. Till death do we part. Ugh. Kate will tell you this is a true story. I told her how romantic I was. About three days before we got married, I looked at her. I said, are you sure you want to do this? She said, yes. I said, are you sure? It's not too late to back out, but once we marry, I will never grant you a divorce. I was dead serious. I gave her my serious eyes. I got mean eyes. She's like, no, I mean it. I said, no, 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 look at me. I will never grant you a divorce. So you got to be sure. And I'm sure. Okay. I told my two kids who got married, it's not too late to say I don't until you say I do. I told my daughter, sweetie, I know I'm the one marrying you. I know we're doing all this preparation. You can get up there on the center of the aisle. And when I say, do you take this man? You can say no. At that point, I said, we're good. I told my son the same thing. He didn't appreciate it. When Janelle marries, I will tell her the same thing. Until you say I do, you can say I don't. But once you say I do, you do. So that's one reason. Another reason I don't think polygyny is a great idea right now is because there's no need for it. We're not at war with the Israelite men dying left and right, and all of a sudden we got all these Israelite women out here and no men to take care of them. They're going to be captured, taken away slaves, or, or worse, as women. There's no need to have multiple wives. We've got single brothers, and Brother Justin's not here right now, who aren't married yet. So why would I take some young wife, or I'm old, one of these younger brothers, take a young wife when Brother Sam isn't married yet? That doesn't make any sense to me. It's like, you got one, let him get one, or, or any other single brother. And so there's no need for polygyny right now. And here's the other thing. Many 
of the seven people that I know that married second wives weren't really supporting their first wife in a good manner. It's not like they were King David and had all the riches in the world. If you can't support your first wife and family, you got no business trying to take on a second wife and have more kids with her. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. It says you will not diminish your first wife. Well, if you're not even providing for her correctly, and I tell you what, I realize there's a tunnel there big enough to drive a train through. My wife and I had long talks when I wanted to quit my job and go into full-time ministry, and she let me know it's your duty to provide for me. Yeah, but what does provide mean? A roof over your head, clothes on your back, and food in your belly is provision. Now, some people are barely making that happen. And if you're not making that happen for your first wife and kids, you got no business taking a second wife and kids. Um, you can't diminish the first. I think... i got to word this carefully. I think what's really going on in the movement today with this polygyny and these second, third wives is lust. I really do. I think these guys are getting tired of their first wife and they see this version 2.0 of a woman and they're like, hey, I can have more than one wife and that's what they're doing. And in fact, <laughs> all the ones that I know about, second wife didn't make it. So it's like, hmm, it's not all that. We got to think up here, not be driven by our baser instincts as men. And it's like, hey, deal with what you got. That is my views on polygyny. Do I support polygyny? I don't know. You tell me. You know, it's lawful. It's clearly lawful. I just don't think it's a good idea today. Uh, there may be a time when it's something we have to do, but that time is not today. Let's pray.